Good evening. This is Lifelong Learners. And I am your coordinator for tonight. And we're excited because we have Jeff Thomas back again. And the topic is called The Ship That Time Forgot. I'm excited to hear about this one. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you. Let's see here. I have a notification in the middle of my screen here. Hang on one second. Okay. So the ship that time forgot, believe it or not, is what we would call a modern shipwreck sinking in 1953. You hear a title like that, you would probably think that we're talking the 1800s here. But uh, the, the Henry Steinbrenner is, has been a story that's fascinated me since I first heard about it. Uh, I have no real reason for that other than I feel a little bad for this boat because everyone forgot about it. And only a handful of ships have gone down on the Great Lakes since the loss of the Steinbrenner. And yet we remember them and, and not, not poor Henry here. So I'm here tonight to tell you his story. And we'll see that really probably wasn't a good idea to sail on the Henry Steinbrenner because right from the get-go, the Steinbrenner was what we call a bad luck boat. So it was built in 1901 at the Jenks Shipbuilding uh, Yard in Port Huron, Michigan. And before it even touches water for the first time, the shipyard catches on fire. Not off to a good start. Fortunately, the firefighters were able to save not only the uh, the, uh, the main shipbuilding equipment at the yard, but also the ship itself, although it did destroy all the buildings at the shipyard. Uh, but the firefighters were at least able to put it out before it damaged the Steinbrenner completely. So she's already in trouble before it even launches. And then it is launched and they finish fitting it out and you know putting all the little amenities into the cabins. And then on November 14th, of 1901, the Steinbrenner is leaving Port Huron to begin its maiden voyage in the evening of the 14th, and it promptly runs into the 10th Street Bridge, doing a considerable amount of damage. And the rumor is that the Steinbrenner left at that particular hour of the night because the owners wanted to avoid it beginning a voyage on a Friday, because there's a superstition among sailors that voyages should not start on Friday. So they want to avoid that bad luck. So they avoided the bad luck of starting on a Friday to get the bad luck of hitting a bridge. Not off to a good start. It gets worse, sad to say. A few years later, in December of 1909, the Steinbrenner is downbound in the St. Mary's River coming down from the Sioux Locks. And he's nearing, if you can see that kind of round island, I think I have a little cursor here. This little island right here is called Round Island. And he's approaching that island downbound. And it's, it's a winter storm. It's windy. There's snow. And he hears an upbound vessel blow a passing signal. Now, in 1909, of course, there's not ship-to-ship -ship radio. So there were particular whistle signals that were used so captains would know which side of the vessel they're going to pass on. And he hears, he hears the, the, the standard whistle signal for a starboard to starboard passing or right side to right side. And Captain Lower of the Steinbrenner answers. He thinks all is well. And right as they're approaching each other, the captain of the other ship suddenly changes his mind and blows the signal for a port to port or left to left side crossing. There's no time actually for him to respond to that. He does try to at least slow down. That other vessel is the Harry Berwind, and he's going to crash right into the starboard side of the Steinbrenner, about the number three hatch, and punch a really nice big hole in the Steinbrenner. Loaded ships with big holes in them sink rather rapidly. <laughs> So the, the crew of the Steinbrenner have to abandon ship real quickly in the yawl boats. And they have quite a story to tell. Again, it's a winter storm. So even though they are technically in a river, the seas aren't so calm to be out there in a rowboat. And it's none too warm in December. 
And then, of course, the captain, the second mate, and the wheelsmen are trapped up in the bow section because the water is shallow enough that the forward and aftermost cabins are still above water. And so these three men are stuck up on the bow and they're listening in the darkness. They're listening to other ships passing and they're coming within 20 feet of them. And so they are, they get a lantern going to let upbound ships know that there's a sunken boat in their way. And finally the Berwind lowers a lifeboat and comes, gets these three guys off of the wreck and they go to the round Island lighthouse. The lighthouse keeper takes them in, warms them up for the night. And then a passing freighter takes them back to the Sioux the next day. But it was, it was quite a, uh, quite a hectic night for the crew of the, the Steinbrenner, and it leaves the poor Steinbrenner looking like this. So now what do you do? You can't leave the ship in the middle of the shipping lane in the river. So the, the uh, Kinsman line abandons her to the insurance company, and they give the contract to raise it to the famous Reed Wrecking Company for $30,000. And now Captain Tom Reed is the most famous of the salvagers on the Great Lakes. He's very good at what he does. He does manage to get a patch over the hole in the side of the Steinbrenner. But he's going to have to wait until spring to raise it. By the time we get the patch over the hole, the river's already freezing over. And so the, the Steinbrenner is going to have to wait all winter sunk in the ice until spring. Come spring, he is able to raise raise the Steinbrenner, tows it to detour where they make some more solid uh, repairs to it and actually get the engines working. And she's going to take off down the lakes for permanent repairs under her own power. She might be a bad luck boat, but she's a tough little boat. So he gets it floated and they're going to take off for Port Huron. When she arrives on June 4th of 1910, it, like I said, it's under her own power. But then they get by Detroit and they realize it's leaking again. So they have to, they have to make a dock in Detroit. And Captain Reed is given another contract for $1,500 to fix the leak so it can be safely towed across Lake Erie. They're headed for Cleveland through all this. This is the longest trip to Cleveland in history, I think. And so he, he makes some more minor repairs and plugs up the new leaks. And they're going to take it to Cleveland for permanent repairs at the shipyard. But to add insult to injury, when they arrive at the shipyard, the first thing the Steinbrenner does is run aground. You can't make this up. So unfortunately, it was not, you know, it wasn't going full speed ahead. It was easily pulled out of the mud and sent into the shipyard and it's permanently repaired. And that leads to a bit of a legal battle because all of a sudden the kin or the, uh, yeah, excuse me, the kinsman line is thinking, you know, we want our boat back. Remember they had surrendered it to the insurance company. So technically the insurance company owed the, owned the vessel. They're thinking they want it back now that the insurance company is paid to fix it up. And the insurance company says, I don't think so. So they're actually fixing the boat while the legalities of who owns it is going on. Eventually, they work out a deal where the Kinsman Transit Company buys it back from the insurance company. So the Steinbrenner's patched up, back to work. When on October 11th, 1923, she's working her way up Whitefish Bay, not in a fog, but she's blinded by smoke. There are forest fires in the Upper Peninsula at this time. And the wind is blowing the smoke over Whitefish Bay. So even though it's not technically fog, it's a foggy type condition. And she runs into another ship. She's going to run into the John Kennedy. Fortunately, nobody sinks this time. But the, uh, the Steinbrenner is faced with $8,100 in repairs. The Kennedy is going to be facing $17,000 in repairs. $17,000 in uh, 1923 is a lot of money. And so fortunately, there were no, no lives lost. No, neither vessel sank. It's just another story in the timeline of the Henry Steinbrenner. At this point, I don't think I'd sign on to sail on this boat. I'm pretty sure 
I would just stay ashore and find another berth if I had to. Um, because those are just, those are just the stories she survives. If we fast forward a little bit to 69 years ago today, May 10th, 1953, she is loading up in Superior, Wisconsin. She's loading 6,800 tons of coal bound for a Lake Erie port, and they're going to take off down the lake. And when they leave, it is a gorgeous, perfect spring day. It's low 70 degrees. It is zero wind. Lake Superior is flat calm. Yes, Lake Superior does become flat calm once in a while. It is so calm, in fact, that the captain does not tell his crew to put the tarps over the hatch covers that will make them waterproof. And just to kind of explain how this works, if you look at this picture of the Steinbrenner, you can see those hatch covers that go across her deck. That's how the cargo gets loaded into it. Those are what we call telescoping hatch covers. And so how they work is like this. Okay, so when they're open, they look exactly like this. You can see how they're kind of stacked up. They look like those sections are stacked on top of one another. They actually pull out to the edge of the ship like this and stack up. When they close, they're pulled toward the center of the ship and they do this. But notice the seams between those different sections of the cover. These hatch covers are not watertight. If a wave were to wash over this hatch cover, it would leak in between those seams. And so to make them watertight, they're supposed to put tarps over the top of them, like you see here, those blue tarps. But Lake Superior was so calm that uh, Captain Stiglin said, we don't, we don't need to bother putting them on, which I'm sure, I'm sure his deckhands were very happy to get that order because putting the, the tarps on is a long and hard process. So it saved them a lot of work. The forecast wasn't too bad. It was calling for south to southeast winds, 30 to 35 miles an hour. It's going to make for a little bit of a bumpy trip, but it's certainly nothing that the Steinbrenner hasn't handled before. So we should be okay. Problem. The weatherman was wrong. What he runs in, into is going to be east winds gusting up to 80 miles an hour. And at that point, it's going to prove to be way too difficult to button up the Steinbrenner. So where he is, is he's out here off of Isle Royal, and he runs into this storm that is exponentially more powerful than what the weatherman forecasted. And at Early or late in the evening of the 10th is about when he starts running into it. And the guys in the pilot house looked down the deck and those aftermost hatch covers, they realized that some of those individual leaves, they call them, those individual sections, some of them were working loose. And in 20 foot seas, these, these waves are going right over the deck. And if your hatch covers are coming loose, if they're falling apart, then those waves are pouring right into the cargo hold. And that is a extremely dangerous situation for a lakes freighter. A loaded Great Lakes freighter has a very hard time pumping water out of the cargo hold, just the way they're designed to haul bulk cargo. Once water gets into that cargo hold, it is next to impossible to pump it out. And even if they could, open hatches are going to let in more water than the pumps can pump out. So he has a real problem. So believe it or not, four guys, have to walk out on deck being swept by waves and go fix these hatch covers. And there's a lifeline that goes down the middle of the ship and these guys get safety harnesses on and they actually clip themselves to this lifeline. So if anyone gets washed overboard, their shipmates can pull them back aboard. I'm glad we don't have those now. So they go out there and one guy, in the process of fixing the hatch covers, one guy falls into the cargo hold. He actually falls through the open hatch and his shipmates have to pull him back up out on deck. And fortunately he wasn't hurt too terribly bad, but these four guys realize there's no way they're gonna get back to the bow. There's no way they're walking 300 feet of deck in these waves back the way they came. So they're kind of marooned on the stern of the ship. Things go okay for a little while. And then 
Captain Stuglin realizes several hours later those same hatch covers are working loose again. And by this point, it's early morning of the 11th. There's no way the storm has increased even more. There's no way these four guys can go back out. Um, if they almost didn't survive the first time, and now the storm is even stronger, they're not going to be able to get back out and fix them a second time. And then they realize up in the pilot house that the Steinbrenner's not acting quite right. They're turning the wheel, and the ship is just not responding as quickly as she should, which tells them there's way too much water in the cargo hold. And so something has to happen to the Steinbrenner quickly or she will go down, which leads Captain Stiglin to make an incredible maneuver. He's going to turn the ship around. And that is highly dangerous in a storm. You'd never want to turn your broadside to waves. If he doesn't have the power to get out of the trough of the waves between those waves in the middle of his turn, he could actually capsize the ship. But he has, he's faced with two options. He can either keep going the way he is, and he knows he's going to sink eventually, or he can turn around, hopefully survive the turn, and he's trying to use his stern deck house to give his men enough protection to go fix those hatch covers. They complete the turn, and it doesn't work. The waves are going right around the stern deck house, not providing any protection at all, and so those guys cannot get out and repair the hatch covers. So after about 10 minutes, he turns around again. He puts it back on the original course and they're going to try to make a run for the other end of the lake. They have to, they're down to hoping that the Steinbrenner will last long enough to get to Whitefish Point, basically. It doesn't take much longer. It's about seven o'clock in the morning of the 11th when he realizes that the Steinbrenner is going to sink. It's really low in the water now. It's not answering the helm. And so he has to make a decision that no captain wants to make. He has to tell his men to get off this thing. So he sounds the general alarm. He issues the abandoned ship order. And by this point in 1953, there is ship to ship radio. So he grabs the radio in the pilot house and he starts issuing a mayday call. The Steinbrenner is not going to be salvageable at this point. When he issues that mayday call, there are a lot of ships that hear it because most ships are at anchor somewhere. They're, they're in safety from this storm. But when they hear the mayday call, these ships are going to pick up their anchor and they're going to go pounding through these 20 foot waves that just 10 minutes before they want to know part of. One of the ships that the, is going to hear the mayday call is the largest on the Great Lakes at the time, the Joseph H. Thompson. And she has kind of a already a heroic history. She started as a troop transport ship at D-Day at Normandy. So this is not her first time working in a crisis. And she's going to go answer the Mayday call. The steamer Wilfred Sykes is also going to head for the scene along with the Pittsburgh Steamship Company vessel, the DM Clemson. If you listen to my presentation last month, it is not the DM Clemson that I talked about in my ghost presentation. This is the DM Clemson number two. Someone else is going to answer the Mayday call. And that's going to be the Coast Guard station in Grand Marais, Minnesota. They're going to send a 36-foot motor lifeboat. In a storm that's sinking a 400-plus foot steel freighter, these guys are going to go out in a 36-foot lifeboat. And believe it or not, they're going to get there. They're led by Bozen's, uh, Bozen's mate, first class, John Mixon. They will get to the scene, but by that point, these three freighters have already picked up all the survivors. They will, however, pick up one of the lost crewmen from the Steinbrunner, and then they'll go back to their station. Word is the stress of getting that lifeboat out to the scene and back in that storm. When they got back to the station, John Mixon had a heart attack. The stress was that hard on him that when he was done, he sat down in his chair and he had a heart attack, but he went. I believe he survived the heart attack as well. Those Coast Guard guys are tough. Interestingly, one thing we never get to see is what a rescue at sea looks like. Someone on board the Joseph Thompson had a camera. And so these are, these are firsthand photographs of the rescue of the Steinbrenner crew. And you can see, uh, this, is, this is the forward uh, life raft. So they had lifeboats back in the stern 
And then at the forward end of the ship, they'd had these pontoon style life rafts. And so this would have been, this would have been the bow crew. Captain Stiglin would have been aboard this particular raft. Um, and so they're getting up here next to the side of the Joseph H. Thompson. And then they get right along the side. You can see the guy where it says Hannah line on the back of his coveralls. That'd be a crewman from the Thompson. He's gone over the side of the ship and he's helping to, he's tying a line onto the raft to secure it on. And they're going to tie ropes on these guys. They're going to haul them right up the side of the ship out in the middle of the lake. And one thing that the, the Wilfred Sykes does, so this is on board the Thompson and this other ship that you see to the side, that's the Wilfred Sykes. She's turned her, by now the storm is, is dissipating. These aren't 80 mile an hour wind gusts anymore, but the Sykes is providing a lee for the Thompson. She's using her side to break the wind and the waves to provide some calm water for these guys to get the, uh, the survivors out of the water. And then you can see here this big knot. They've got this guy up on the deck. So they would they tied a big heavy line around these guys and just pulled them up the side of the ship into safety. But to me, this is one of the coolest things of the Steinbrenner story because we never see pictures of a rescue at sea. These are working guys. They're not out there on a cruise. They don't take their cameras. So I don't, I don't know the name of the guy who had the camera. I don't know who took the pictures, but I'm really glad he was there at that particular time. It, uh, that evening, the evening of the 11th, news is starting to break that the Steinbrenner's gone down, uh, but there's not a whole lot of information yet. The headlines are simply announcing that a, a ship has been lost on Lake Superior. The Thompson is going to bring Captain Stiglin and 11 other survivors to the Sioux. And, of course, the captain doesn't want to say too much because there, of course, will be a Coast Guard investigation. He doesn't want to say too much to the press right away. Uh, but everyone wants to know what happened to the Steinbrenner. So in a typical terse captain sort of way, he describes the event as... The decks were awash. She was pitching and rolling. Four or five hatch covers swept away and she filled with water. Well, that covers the story. He's not going to give too many details before the inevitable Coast Guard investigation. Once the investigation starts, it will start in Sault Ste. Marie and then later on it will, it will move to Cleveland. The Coast Guard officers, uh, they go up to the Sioux so they can interview people as, as quickly as they can. Um, at that point, the captain starts telling more details of what happened to the ship, the weather conditions it ran into. He makes, he makes sure that he gives careful account of what he did to try to save the Steinbrenner because uh, he could face some some consequences here if he was proved negligent. So he makes sure he focuses on what he did to save the boat. And the other crewmen just talk about how cold it was for four and a half hours on a pontoon in Lake Superior in May. They also talk about one other story. They make sure to talk about their third assistant engineer, Arthur Morse. Arthur Morse is going to be lost in the sinking but he's going to play a very significant role in seven other guys. The starboard lifeboat at the stern, when they launched that, and the guys did well. It's very difficult to get a lifeboat in the water in stormy seas. They managed to get it in the water. They didn't, they didn't launch it. And they got in the water, and they realized they were still connected to the sinking ship. There's a rope called a painter that you tie onto the rail of the ship. Well, before they started lowering the lifeboat, someone forgot to untie it. And now they are 20 feet below, below where it's tied on. No one has a knife to cut the line and they are in a lifeboat still tied to the ship that's sinking. And it's looking like it might take them down with it. When Arthur Morse suddenly walks out of the aft cabins, sees what's going on, walks over and unties the line. And he, he waves at his shipmates, turns around, and walks back into the aft cabins. He makes no attempt to jump overboard and maybe swim to the lifeboat, although one guy says he yelled at him to jump. And apparently it was Arthur Morse's opinion that when the big boat is sinking, the little boat's not going to do any better. 
And so he chose to go down with the Steinbrenner and he was lost in the sinking, but before he was lost, he did save seven crewmen's lives. Of course, the rescuers are always praised, right? So um, the Hannah line present every member of the crew of the Thompson with a $50 um, savings bond. And the Inland Steel Fleet provides a savings bond for the crew of the Wilford Sykes. And the Pittsburgh Steamship Company is going to award gold medals to every crewman aboard the DM Clemson. Not only did the men get something for what they did, the boats do too. And every ship that answered the Mayday call got a brass plaque to be displayed aboard ship. This would be somewhere in a prominent place uh, aboard their ship. It lists the name of the vessel, and it lists the event that happened, and it lists every single name of every crew member who was aboard at the time of the rescue, from the captain right on down to the lowest ranked crewman. Everyone's name is on that plaque. It's not a long investigation. You know, uh, the, some of the more famous shipwrecks, the ones that kind of overshadow the Steinbrenner, the Morrell and the Bradley and the Fitzgerald. Of course, their investigations took much longer. But with 17 survivors, it didn't take the Coast Guard very long to figure out what happened to the Steinbrenner. So on May 18th in Cleveland, the investigation officially comes to a close. And the Coast Guard Investigation Board rules that the sinking was an act of God. Okay. They rule that no one was at fault. The storm was much stronger than it should have been, that it was forecasted to be. And they rule that no one's at fault. And they also recommend Arthur Morse for special commendation for his actions before he was lost. The Coast Guard Commandant rejects all of these. He says, there's no way. He, said, he points to a regulation that says, it is the captain's responsibility to ensure that his vessel is weatherproof before leaving protected waters. And he says the fact that Stiglin did not order the tarps put over the hatch covers means he was derelict in his duty and he is responsible for the loss of the ship. Interestingly, he also denies the commendation for Arthur Morse. And he says that no one on board did anything above their expected duty. And that didn't sit well with the seven guys that he saved. So Captain Stiglin is not off the hook, shall we say. The Commandant of the Coast Guard has rejected his board's findings and he is recommended for prosecution. Initially, there's six charges against him. Three get dropped and he's going to face prosecution for three remaining charges. The U.S. Attorney General's Office reviews the case and they determine that there's nothing to prosecute here. So he's not going to go on criminal trial for what happens. Should be good news, but unfortunately, poor Captain Stiglin is not out of the woods yet. Now he has to face a hearing from the Coast Guard to see if they're going to take away his captain's license. Poor guy is just being attacked on all sides. And that investigation turns into a he said, he said about the condition of the Steinbrenner. The, invest, the, the testimony in, in the investigation about Captain Stiglin almost reads like reality TV, really. So now the investigation over the sinking is done, and now they are simply, it's, he's almost on trial for his, his job. He's not facing jail time anymore, <laughs> but the Coast Guard could come in and revoke his master's license, and he could never sail again. So in March of 1954, he's once again on trial, and there's a deckhand that worked on the Steinbrenner, Archie Malloy, who says that the hatch clamps were faulty. He said there are a lot of the hatch clamps that actually battened down the hatch covers, not the tarps, but the, the pieces that were falling off in the storm. He says a lot of those, they, they screw on, so you can put tension on them by just tightening them. So a lot of the threads were stripped out. They actually wouldn't tighten like they're supposed to. Well, that raised eyebrows. And when he was asked about it, Captain Stiglin said, I never heard that story. I was never told that we had any issues with, with uh, hatch clamps. And 
to be fair, in the captain's defense, it's not his job to physically go inspect the deck before he takes off. If that had been a problem, there's a chain of command. It should have been reported to him, but it's not his responsibility to physically go look at every hatch clamp before he departs a port. Another captain actually contradicted some of what Stiglin said. Okay, so the master of the Robert L. Ireland, Captain William Humphrey, he was actually in the same vicinity of Lake Superior as the Steinbrenner when it went down. And he said, I didn't have tarps over my hatches either. I didn't think the storm was that bad. We were in no danger of sinking. No ship really should have been lost in this storm. So you have another captain that's contradicting Stiglin. Another captain in the same part of the lake is saying, no way but through negligence would the Steinbrenner have been lost. But back to the faulty hatch cover or hatch clamps. Okay, maybe we have a physical problem here that was missed. Except a month and eight days before she sank, the Coast Guard and did their annual inspection and said she was seaworthy. So if the hatch clamps weren't good, you'd think the Coast Guard inspector would find that. And they didn't. Ultimately, he's actually cleared of everything. He does not lose his license. He gets to go back to sailing after a 10-month ordeal between various courtrooms. This man was on trial in some courtroom somewhere for basically 10 months before he got to find out what was going to happen to him. And that's really kind of where the story of the Steinbrenner stops. There are 17 survivors, 16 men are lost. Should have been front page news for a while. It should have been in the public mind for quite a while. But five years later, the Carl D. Bradley is going to sink. And then in 66, the Daniel J. Morrell will sink. And of course, we know in 1975, that ship with a song about it sank. And so the Steinbrenner is lost. It's forgotten. But there are still links to it still with us today. And in fact, the, one of the coolest links is the first mate who unfortunately was lost is from Alpina. So we have an Alpina connection to this story as well. But there's some other links to this story that's still around. The Wilfred Sykes has been converted to a modern self unloader, and she is still sailing around even now. The Joseph H. Thompson in the 90s was converted to a barge, but most of her hull is still sailing. You might notice something interesting about that picture. Obviously, that's a picture taken from on board the Thompson. Because in August 2020, I sailed that ship. So I have a personal connection to this story. Those pictures I showed you of the rescue, yeah, I've walked those deck plates. I've been there. And then a couple of years ago, we took a vacation out to the Keweenaw Peninsula, and we went to the Eagle Harbor uh, Life Saving Station. It's a museum now. And this is the only piece of my favorite shipwreck story that I've ever physically seen. Turns out one of the deck lights, this looks like a, a spotlight probably, broke loose in the sinking. And because it's a sealed unit, had some buoyancy. and it was picked up out of, the, out of the water and it's on display. I had no idea it was there. We went there for a totally different reason. We just wanted to see the museum and, and we were exploring the Keweenaw Peninsula and walked into the boathouse. And here's a piece of, of my favorite shipwreck story. And so there is a piece of it still around. And so the, the Henry Steinbrenner has not been found yet. Um, it is somewhere off that tip of the Isle Royal. We know basically where it is. It should be somewhere in about five to 600 feet of water. So it's very deep. The problem is some of these stories, some of these wrecks, we know round about where they are. But Lake Superior is so remote. And trust me, when you're in that part of Lake Superior, you are a long way from nowhere. And so the shipwreck hunters have a really hard time logistically getting out there to go find it because they have to carry so much extra gas for their boat motors. There's not a gas station on Isle Royal for their, for their diving boats, for their searching boats. 
So no one goes out there and goes looking for it. I don't know when it'll be found. I do know one of the premier shipwreck hunting groups has it on their list of to find wrecks. And those three guys have found some major ones in the last five to eight years. So hopefully in a couple of years, maybe less, maybe we'll get to see her again. But until now, she's still lost somewhere at the bottom of Lake Superior. But at least tonight, she's not forgotten anymore. That's the story of the Henry Steinbrenner. So I think I actually went kind of quick through that one. But uh, are there any, any questions? Because that is officially the end of my story this month. Can I ask? Absolutely. First mate, yes. You could if I could remember it. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you. 